13th century dance music on the saxophone. Let's see what we can learn from DJ Bach. Hi, and welcome to the Saxophone Academy. I'm Dr. Wally Wallace, and if you're interested in saxophone master classes and product reviews, please do subscribe and be sure to hit the like button, because first of all, you're getting free sheet music, and second of all, at no point in this video did I make a bad pun on the word Bach or Baroque. You're welcome. Now today, we're looking at the Courant from Bach's first cello suite, and this will be the first addition to a what will be a growing library of classic works available free for everyone. If we're going to have weekly lessons working on fundamentals, music, and different styles and genres, we need to be working from the same page, so I'm committed to starting to build a free library of music, which will be the basis of these lessons in addition to the saxophone fundamentals book. So, first things first, make sure you go ahead and download this free sheet music to the Courant from the Cello Suite. I'll put a link down below. So let's talk about Bach, a late Baroque composer. So late that when he died, he took the entire time period with him. Of course, musicologists look at time periods and name them after the fact, but musicologists generally agree with the death of Bach being the end of the Baroque period. That doesn't mean style of music suddenly changed, it's just a convenient date, 1750, when he died, when they say that's when the Baroque ended and the classical era started. Composers at the time were, of course, unaware of this, of what future musicologists would classify their music as, but it's good to know that the Baroque era, 1600 to 1750, Bach's death ended, in the musicologist's eyes, the end of the Baroque era. So, he wrote six cello suites, suites for unaccompanied cello, and this is from the first one. These are very popular, not only on the cello, but every instrument imaginable. Bassists, violists, trumpets, horn players, accordions, every instrument on the planet will transcribe and adapt these, including the saxophone. And we're going to learn a lot from this. Now, being that this is Baroque music and Bach being played on the saxophone, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about this, so let me give you my feelings on the matter right away so we can all be on the same page, or you can go watch a cat video. Your choice. So, we are playing cello music on the saxophone. I view this as a way to learn and train on the saxophone, not trying to recreate how the cello sounded. The cellists have their own sound, we have our own. I do not view the job of the saxophonist as to make it sound like a cello. I think we should make it sound like a saxophone and adapt and do the best we can to make this as musical as possible while learning important lessons in the process. So, I don't believe we need to circular breathe and I don't believe we need to do strange things to recreate the sounds of a cello string crossing. I think we need to do what works on the saxophone as musically as possible. Authenticity kind of went out the window the minute we started playing 18th century music on the saxophone. So, instead of trying to be authentic, which is a very loaded term that gets musicologists into a fist fight to begin with, let's worry about making great music and, I don't know, having fun? You with me? All right, let's go. Now, in this lesson, we're focusing on the first half of this movement, so let's go ahead and take a listen. Now, if you've tightened your whalebone corset correctly, you'll recognize this, of course, as the Courant, the 16th century dance of advancing and retreating quick steps, much like Dr. Wally fighting a spider, only with less screaming. So this is a dance. If you're wondering what this dance looked like, let's take a look at the diagram. So now that we've cleared that up, let's talk about the dance. More importantly, knowing that this is a stylized dance in music. Much of the music that we're playing, we're playing stylized dances in the Brook. And what that means is it's informed by the dance, but it's not, I repeat, not meant to be danced to. This is art music, not background music for a dance party. So the Courant, specifically the three pulse, will inform how we play this and notate it in three, four time, but it does not mean it needs to be danced to. So, armchair nerds will say, like, it's too fast, it's too slow, you can't dance to this. 
it wasn't meant to be danced to. And also we're playing it on the saxophone, so let's see what we can learn from this rather than arguing over the precise definition and tempo to be dancing the Quran. So in today's lesson, we're gonna address three concepts related to this movement. We're gonna talk about articulating implied counterpoint. We're gonna talk about Baroque ornamentation and range shifting. So let's talk about counterpoint. What counterpoint you ask? Well, in much of Bach's solo music, there's the implication of a second voice. N not the one telling you that your mother was right and you never amount to anything. It's a second musical voice adding counterpoint to the main melodic line. So let's take a listen to this. First, hear it as it's written. <laughs> Now let's listen to it with just the implied upper melodic voice. And now let's hear the implied counterpoint. So in order to make this counterpoint effective, we need to be very careful of how we are articulating and implying the continuation of this bass line while we play the upper voice, which leads to how we tongue on the saxophone. The danger is that we make these notes too short and while we're trying to get them out in these register leaps, and we don't have the implication of a bass line ringing out while we play the upper melody. So we want those implied lower tones to feel as if they're ringing out and in a nice concert hall, they really kind of can while we're playing the upper line. Now those lower notes are somewhat easier for the cello because they simply do string crossing, which we can't do on the saxophone. So we need to be very careful of not to overly shorten those note lengths. So in jazz, very commonly, we end the note with the tongue. So instead of a da, we use a dat or a dit in the jazz idiom to create more clarity and punch on those notes. In the classical world, we are more often than not going to end the notes with a da or a do syllable. And then we have a softer ending, which especially in a nice concert hall, lets the notes somewhat ring out and we can actually create our own implied counterpoint more easily that way. And if we tongue too short, it simply does not work and it sounds like a struggling etude, not an interesting complex piece of music. <laughs> Next up, let's talk about ornamentation, specifically the Baroque trill, which is performed differently than modern music or how we would in a Sousa march. In the Baroque era, we start on the upper neighbor, leaning into the harmonic tension and resolving to the goal note. Got it? No? All right, well, let's take a look at an example in measure 16. So in modern music, we would start on the note, which is notated with the trill, on that note, and trill upwards diatonically, which means in the key. So in modern music, if it's an E and we're in the key of F, for instance, we trill up to F. If we were in the key of G, which has one sharp, and there was an E with a trill in it, we would trill to F sharp because that's diatonic to the key of G. Now in this instance, we are playing Baroque music. So instead of starting on the note, we start on the upper neighbor, which is one note up diatonically, in this case, F, then we trill downward to the goal note. So we start on that F, that upper neighbor, sound it, create some tension, 
and then we do the trill on E, but we end with the E to be able to perceive the gold note before we move on. Take a listen one more time. Now the third concept we're working on is the register leap. Performed poorly and we sound like a honkopotamus. It's much easier on the cello in this instance. It was written for cello after all. The cellist can do the register leaps by simply crossing strings. We don't have that luxury on the saxophone. Though we do have the luxury of being able to buy a professional instrument without needing a trust fund. Professional cellos can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we can have great instruments for much less. So suck it, cello nerds. But registered leaps are more challenging from this, so let's talk about some strategies to make them work. First off, we need to have the mechanics of air embouchure and voicing in place. That is outside the scope of this video, but I covered it two weeks ago in the Ultimate Tone Exercise, Exercise Zero. So check out that video to address the airstream, embouchure, and voicing. That will be the critical component of covering the mechanics before we even address what we're gonna be talking about here. Now, assuming you have the mechanics of playing low B flat, well down, let's talk about two concepts that are gonna help with these register leaps, isolation in your practice and finger anticipation. First up, isolation. Now, if I were a betting man and saw you practicing through this, I'm guessing you're going to hork that low B flat. The danger would be you immediately go back to the beginning and then play the first couple of measures, hork the low B flat again, start over, rinse and repeat like a honky Sisyphus with the saxophone, you accomplish very little. What we want to do is isolate our opportunity for growth. I didn't say a problem. I didn't say it was hard. It's simply a lovely opportunity for growth. Isolate that interval, that opportunity, and repeat and create a little exercise out of working on that specific item. <laughs> Remember, we don't want to play through what you're already quite comfortable with before we get to the interesting growth opportunity. We want to focus on that, clean all the pedagogical goodness out of it before we move on and before we put it in the context. So create little exercises for yourself and work on the challenge, work on the unfamiliar, not always going back and playing the familiar before you get there. You're kind of turning your wheels and wasting your precious time and mental focus. Now, let's talk about finger anticipation. Watch the register leap from middle B-flat to low B-flat. Do you see it? Watch my pinky. Watch my left pinky. Watch my left pinky. Do you see it? Do you see it? The astute observer will notice that before I play low B flat, I'm anticipating that fingering while I'm playing middle B flat by adding the low B flat key when I play the middle B flat. That means there are less keys to coordinate on the way down. Now, this is a new purchase of mine. It is recently freshly overhauled. It's a great overhaul, but still it is very difficult having perfect regulation where those keys snap down exactly precisely. So we can anticipate some of the key closings that don't affect the intonation of that note like B flat. So we can add the low B flat key when we play a middle B flat. Then when we add the other hand, it's fewer keys closing and helps it pop out. Now you may notice that sounds kind of like the key pop trick. I'm not a conjurer of cheap tricks. I've given this a fancy name, fingering anticipation. So it's a very sophisticated strategy. I think you'll find it very helpful. Practice this by using the low B flat key when you play middle B flat. And then later when we play middle C, go ahead and add your low C key and fewer fingers to add. It will help those notes speak more clearly and more easily. So work on these concepts and start learning this beautiful piece of Bach. I'm going to be back in two weeks when we talk about this courant again, finish it out and talk about articulation patterns and scale patterns as they relate to this piece of Baroque music. Next week, we're going to talk about Stan Getz and blues implications. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I hope you have a most wonderful weekend and I will see you very soon. 
go practice.